Noise shaping, as the name suggests, is a technique for shaping white noise and manipulating how the noise power is spread across different frequency bands. It's not lowering the noise, but rather shifting the noise to higher frequencies to make the noise less apparent and less audible and thereby increase the effective dynamic range that's available. Noise shaping is not a standalone process. It's never done on its own. It's only ever applied alongside dithering and only when reducing the bit depth of the audio. Well, technically, it can be applied without dithering, but then you'd be shaping spectral distortion from quantization error, not noise. We've previously looked at dithering and why it's needed, and you can check it out here if you haven't already. Noise shaping, like dithering, is not going to turn any heads. It's not a particularly exciting process where you can observe a lot of audible differences in the end. In fact, the effects of dithering and noise shaping are so subtle that you'd have to listen really hard to spot the difference for most applications of audio. But it doesn't mean that it's useless. Dithering, for example, is an absolutely integral part of the process of bit reduction, especially when reducing the bit depth to 16 bits. Without it, there could be unexpected distortion components and artifacts in your audio file. To preserve the integrity of the audio file, you have to dither. Noise shaping is not absolutely necessary, but it's nice to have. Since noise shaping increases the effective dynamic range, it makes 16-bit audio an attractive option without needing to go any higher in bit depth. There's a caveat when using a technique called delta sigma modulation rather than the more commonly used uh, pulse code modulation, where noise shaping is a really important and integral part of the process. But that's for another time. Let's not go there yet. That's where noise shaping and oversampling come into picture. All right, let's get to the crux of this. How does shaping white noise get us a higher dynamic range? For this, we need to understand the equal loudness curves. There's a whole video dedicated to this in the module on acoustics, so I'll be brief here. We are interested in a single curve in this set of curves. The bottom one, the threshold. This single curve represents a concept called the absolute threshold of hearing. Quite simply, it visually shows us the minimum sound pressure level of a pure tone that an average human ear can hear with no other sound present. We can see that the human ear is quite sensitive between the range of 500 Hz to 5 kHz and isn't very sensitive below 500 Hz and above 5 kHz. Essentially, loudness perception is frequency dependent. White noise is random noise. The noise power is distributed evenly across the entire frequency spectrum. What if we could model this curve and spread the noise power around such that most of the power is situated in ranges of frequency that our ears aren't very sensitive to? We're merely redistributing the power here and freeing up some of the space in the middle of the frequency spectrum. Because of how our ears are designed, and because of our psychoacoustic loudness perception, the effective loudness of this shaped noise is lower than plain white noise. This is essentially noise shaping, filtering the noise from the dithering stage to get a little bit more dynamic range in our audio. There are several noise shaping algorithms in use today, and I won't be going over all of them. But I'll give you a taste of what a simple noise shaping algorithm would look like. Here's our handy little sinusoid signal. And here's the same signal with triangular dither applied. The difference between the two signals gives you the noise associated with the process of dithering. Since triangular dither is random, the resultant noise is white noise. We know this, we've discussed this process at length. But what if, instead of choosing a random value at every sampling interval, we take into account the previous value that was chosen and subtract it from the new random value at the next sampling interval? What does this achieve? It essentially means that the random samples have a higher tendency to shift polarity, a tendency to zigzag around more prominently. Although we maintain randomness within the system, the frequency distribution isn't flat anymore, their apparent periodicity is higher, 
which translates to noise in the real world tending to be concentrated in higher frequency bands. We can see this by subjecting the noise to a spectrum analyzer. Essentially, what we did was feed the noise signal back onto itself. This feedback loop forms the basis of a filter. We can look at the whole process more holistically to understand what's happening. When we are reducing the bit depth of an audio signal, we run the signal through a quantizer. And the resultant output signal is bit reduced and would contain quantization error. To eliminate the correlated distortion that results from this quantization error, we add a dither signal to our input signal right before quantization occurs. And now for the interesting bit. If we take the output signal and subtract it from the input signal before dither, we can isolate the error signal. If we then feed the error signal back through a filter and subtract it from the input, we can spectrally shape the quantization noise. This feedback loop would only affect the frequency response of the error signal and would leave the actual input signal intact and unchanged. It has the effect of passing the noise through a filter and not the signal itself. We can have any sort of complicated filtering mechanism here to shape the noise as we please. A suitable weighting function can be utilized with a higher order filter to try and simulate the absolute threshold of hearing curve and spectrally shape the noise to reduce its influence in the critical frequency bands between 500 Hz to 5 kHz. Don't worry if this doesn't make too much sense. Filtering is a huge area of study and I can hopefully get to it at some point in time. Choosing the right filter design is a delicate balancing act. The higher the order of the filter, the finer the control you have over the spectral shape. But implementing higher order filters actually increases the overall noise power that is introduced into the signal. Though we are trying to push noise into less audible bands, having high noise power could have adverse effects like distorting and droning tweeters, for example. Since dithering and noise shaping is such an integral part of audio production and playback, and since it's used in almost every audio appliance, irrespective of the application, a consortium of companies came together to develop and license a set of algorithms for dithering and noise shaping for digital audio, hardware, and software. They're collectively called the power algorithms, psychoacoustically optimized word length reduction. Just rolls off the tongue. Psychoacoustically optimized, meaning that they're optimized for human hearing and the weird nuances that influence our hearing perception. And word length reduction, meaning that they play a role when reducing the bit depth of audio. The singular aim of these algorithms is to achieve the most sonically transparent audio when reducing the bit depth. Chances are that these are the algorithms implemented in your DAW software. They're quite common. There are three variants to it and are used for different audio use cases. The power one, or the original power algorithm, doesn't have any noise shaping at all. It uses a narrow band dither, and the noise is white. This is generally used with low dynamic range mixes, like compressed pop, rock, or metal, where you don't tend to hear noise from quantization. The power two algorithm is used with speech. It includes very subtle noise shaping that attenuates noise at around two kilohertz and amplifies it at around 14 kilohertz and upwards. The power three algorithm is used when the audio is complex in nature, has a really wide dynamic range, like in classical music, and if this audio is intended to be played back in really loud listening environments, like in cinemas and movie theaters. This algorithm implements an aggressive noise shaping curve, which tries to reduce the loudness perception of noise as low as possible. That's all I'm going to talk about dithering and noise shaping. And I've already said too much. If you're a general consumer of music, or a producer even, you set the dither and noise shaping for your project when rendering, and you forget about it. Choosing different algorithms and techniques isn't going to impact the end result by much at all and the differences are incredibly subtle and hard to spot. But they're needed. <laughs> Please don't mistake my indifference to insignificance. Here's a little anecdote that might help you see dithering in a new light. Airplane bombers in World War II used mechanical computers to perform navigation and bomb trajectory calculations. 
These computers were nothing but boxes filled with hundreds of gears and cogs. Curiously, these computers performed more accurately when flying on board the aircraft than on the ground. Engineers realized that the vibration from the aircraft reduced the error from sticky moving parts. Instead of moving in short jerks, they moved more continuously. Much later, small vibrating motors were deliberately built into the computers and their vibration was called dither, which in Middle English means to tremble. Today, when you tap an electrical meter or a water meter in your home to get a more precise reading, you're actually applying dither. In any case, in minute quantities, dither essentially simulates analog behavior in digital systems. <laughs>